Hello, now we come to the prologue by Geoffrey Chaucer. In this discussion, we will see the arrival of the pilgrims, Chaucer's portraits of various characters belonging to different classes, focusing on the humor and also various aspects of characterization, class, profession, activities, skills, social status, appearance, dress, age, beliefs and values, behavior, speech patterns, possessions, equipment, horse, even some special identification markers as in the case of the miller who is identified as a character with a wart on his nose. We will examine the narrator's comments in this prologue and then finally, we will look at two dimensions, one is aspects of poetry, another is ideological readings. When we deal with the aspects of poetry, we will examine metaphor, simile, irony, zugma. Actually, as we are looking at some selected characters, we will examine those features as we discuss the characters themselves. Finally, we will have a summary of these features of poetry at the end. We also attempt one ideological reading in this poem. Let us start with the arrival of the pilgrims. You can see some points on the on my right side in brackets. These deal with certain figures of uh, speech or thought and also they refer to the points of characterization. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all, the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower when also Severus with his sweet breath exhales an air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoots and the young sun half his course in the sign of the ram has run. The first line tells us about the beginning of the season that is the April season. In this season, the renew, renewal of life happens that is given to us through the metaphor of the veins being bathed in water with such power. There is also an allusion to Zephyrus, the god of winds, gentle winds in Greek mythology and it tells us about the time, the passing of time during the day. Now, we move to the next nine lines and the small fowl are making melody uh, that sleep away the night with open eye. So, nature pricks them and their heart engages, then people long to go on pilgrimages and palmers long to seek the strangest strands of far off saints hallowed in sundry lands and specially from every shire's end of England down to Canterbury they went to seek the holy blissful matter quick to give his help to them when they were sick. As we summarized in the previous presentation, the pilgrims are here in Tabard Inn to visit Canterbury to seek the blessings and also to express their gratitude to the martyr who helps them whenever they are sick or whenever they need some help. One of the characters we have chosen to focus on is a knight. As we said earlier, this is again a translation. There was a knight, a most distinguished man who from the day on which he first began to ride abroad had followed chivalry tooth, honor, generousness and courtesy, he had done nobly in his sovereign's war and ridden into battle no man more as well in Christian as in heathen places and ever honored for his noble graces. When we took Alexandria, he was there, he often sat a table in chair of honor above all nations when in pressure. In this short extract, we see the knight being described with reference to the knightly tradition, the personal qualities of the knight, his participation in different wars in different locations and the kind of respect that he commands from his peers. The use of we is something interesting 
That is how Chaucer takes the reader into confidence. He invites us to see the character for ourselves. We have something more about the knight here. He was of sovereign value in all eyes and though so much distinguished, he was wise and in his bearing modest as a maid, he never yet a boorish thing he had said in all his life to any, come what might, he was a true perfect gentle knight. It is interesting to see that such a distinguished man does not have any arrogance, pride, he has humility and that is portrayed in the form of the character of a maid, as modest as a maid that we identify this as a human simile. And his behavior that is demeanor is very courteous, very kind, very polite and that is summed up in the last line a true, a perfect gentle knight. No problem with this character, he is an ideal knight. We move on to another character in this prologue. We are not looking at all of them, we have selected some. The first is the knight, the second is the nun. You have the line numbers on my left and some points of discussion on my right in brackets. There was also a nun, a prioress. Her way of smiling, very simple and coy. Her greatest oath was only by Saint Loy. And she was known as Madame Eglinton as, and well she sang a service with a fine, in turning through her nose as was most seemly, and she spoke daintily in French extremely after the school of Stratford at Bow. French in the Paris style she did not know. At meet her manners were well taught withal. No morsel from her lips did she let fall, nor dripped her fingers in the sauce too deep, but she could carry a morsel up and keep the smallest drop from falling on her breast. She is identified as a nun with a smile, with her oath on Saint Love. Her name is also given as Madame Eglinton. She sings through her nose, she speaks French, not the Paris variety, but the variety that is used in England. She is known for her excellent table manners. We also notice some more characteristics of this lady, the nun. She wore a coral trinket on her arm, a set of beads. The goddess tricked in green, whence hung a golden brooch of brightest sheen, on which there first was a graven crowned A and a lower armor wins it omnia. The nun is a woman living in a nunnery. She has some possessions which are extremely attractive, costly and they are glittering. She has also some letter A to indicate armor wins it omnia. That means, love conquers all. So, we have a lady living in a nun, certain characteristic which do not fit in with her own nunnery. That is how Chaucer is able to show the difference between a nun and the, her own behavior and he invites us to look into the character of the nun and understand for ourselves. Another character for our discussion is the friar. The friar is a mendicant, let us see him. There was a friar, a wanton one and merry, a limiter, a very festive fellow in all four orders. There was none so mellow, so glib, with gallant phrase and well turned speech. He had fixed up many a marriage and giving each of his young women what he could afford her. He was a noble pillar to his order. Highly beloved and intimate was he with county folk within his boundary. Before we go to the next part, let us see the comments we have on my right. The major characteristic of this friar is wantonness, merry making. So, throughout the characterization of this pilgrim, we have 
many of the ideas relating to his being a jolly fellow, a festive fellow. He is a very energetic person, his attitude is wonderful and this energetic wonderful attitude is indicated to us through this hyperbole. In all the four orders, there was none like him and his speech is also given some focus. So, glib with gallant phrase and well turned speech, he could attract his clients. He also participates in social functions for his own gratification and that is where we have this irony as well, he is a noble pillar of this order. And one of the most important characteristics of this particular character is he is able to relate to all kinds of people in his area very well. He was intimate that is very interesting, highly beloved and intimate was he with county folk within his boundary and city dames of honor and possessions for he was qualified to hear confessions or so he said with more than priestly scope he had a special license from the pope sweetly heard his penitence at shrift with pleasant ab absolution for a gift. He was an easy man in penance giving where he could hope to make a decent living. The kind of people that he mixes with is what is given here in city dames of honor and possessions. His job what he does is to receive cons confessions from others and he has more functions or he claims that he, had, he has more power to do certain things like getting a special license from the pope. And whatever he does there is a profit motive that is why this idea of profiteering we have mentioned here. He gives mercy easily to people who come to him for confession. He was an easy man in penance giving. What is his service? How does he do it? We have these lines to tell us about the kinds of service that he does. He kept his tippet stuffed with pins of curls and pocket knives to give to pretty girls and certainly his voice was gay and sturdy for he sang well and played the hurdy gurdy. At sing songs he was champion of the hour, his neck was whiter than a lily flower but strong enough to butt a bruiser down. His relationship with pretty girls is given more importance, he sings, he plays music with this instrument hurdy gurdy and even Chaucer notices the white color of his neck to tell us about the, how soft he is. At the same time he tells us the friar is strong enough to rebut a bruiser that is a fighter. We have a few more characteristics of this friar. He knew the taverns well in every town and every innkeeper and barmaid too better than lepers, beggars and that crew for in so eminent as he it was not fitting with the dignity of his position dealing with a scum of wretched lepers nothing good can come of commerce with such slum and gutter dwellers but only with the rich and vital sellers. We have an interesting case of this poetic device called Zygma here in line number 244. He knew that is only one verb that connects two objects here, he knew the taverns well, he knew the innkeeper as well and when it comes to barmaid that knew will have additional connotative meanings which tell us about the friar's own character and wantonness. And so eminent a man will not stoop down to give pardons or to give confessions for a poor wretched people like lepers or slum and gutter dwellers. Next we have the knowledge or the scholarship, what kind of knowledge that the friar has. 
and now he roamed just like a puppy he was ever prompt to arbitrate disputes on settling days for a small fee in many helpful ways not then appearing as your cloistered scholar with the threadbare habit hardly worth a dollar but much more like a doctor or a pope he was a learned man or a man with some knowledge to solve disputes among people in his own area of course for a fee that is important we have this animal simile in line number 264 where chaucer connects puppy with this friar one, on the one hand it tells us about the energy of the character at another level it tells us the character's lower instinct chaucer describes a friar as a man who wears dress properly according to occasion like a doctor or a pope here again we have a human simile that is a man being connected with another man a doctor or a pope his knowledge is extensive it continues along with his physical appearance of double worsted was a semi cope upon his shoulders and the swelling fold about him like a bell about its mole when it is casting rounded out his dress he lisped a little out of wantonness to make his english sweet upon his tongue when he had played his harp or having sung his eyes would twinkle in his head as bright as any star upon a frosty night this worthy his name was hubert it appeared with this description we come to the end of the friar's character in this particular section we see that one material simile we identified it as material simile because there is a reference to a bell in this line number 272 and we also notice how this character uses english sweet upon his tongue he by focusing on this speech quality again chaucer connects with the wantonness or merry making quality of this friar at the end the ironic twist is given to us he is called a worthy but chaucer doesn't take any responsibility he says it appeared it appeared that he was a worthy and his name was hubert now we move on to another character the franklin he belongs to the landed gentry class there was a franklin with him it appeared white as a daisy petal was his beard a sanguine man high colored and benign he loved a morning sop of cake in wine he lived for pleasure and had always done for he was epicurus very son in whose opinion sensual delight was a one true felicity in sight in this section we see a flower simile used to describe the beard of this franklin his disposition is sanguine optimistic he is known for his uh, drink that is wine also we find that he has some aim in life that is to live life very happily and the allusion to epicurus is interesting to tell us that he wants to live life very happily eat drink and be merry that is a philosophy of epicurus it is said so his interest is more in material life we have something more about the generosity of this franklin he may live a material life but then he is a good character as noted as st julian was for bounty he made his household free to all the county his bread his ale were finest of the fine and no one had a better stock of wine his house was never short of bake meat pies of fish and flesh and these in such supplies it positively snowed with meat and drink and all the dainties that a man could think fish and flesh fish and flesh is part of this alliteration and the entire passage tells us about all his belongings particularly those items of drink and food everything is available to everybody we come to a very interesting character in the whole of canterbury tales 
that is the wife of Bath. A worthy woman from beside Bath city was with us somewhat deaf which was a pity. In making cloth she showed so great a bend, she better those of Ypres and of Ghent. In all the parish not a dame dared stir towards the altar steps in front of her and if indeed they did, so wrath was she as to be quiet put out of charity. In this part we see her gender that is she is a woman and she comes from a particular location called Bath city. Chaucer describes the wife of Bath with reference to her gender and also the place of origin that is Bath city. He also points out the hearing capacity difficulty in her. At the same time, he highlights the extreme skill expertise of this lady in making cloth. She is able to actually do better than people from Ypres and Ghent who might have taught her to make cloths. Let us continue with the wife of Bath now. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground. I dared have sewn they weighed a good ten pound, the one she wore on Sunday on her head. Her hose were of the finest scarlet thread and gartered tight, her shoes were soft and new. Bold was her face, handsome and red hue. A worthy woman all her life, what's more, she has had five husbands all at the church door, apart from other company in youth. No need just now to speak of that forsooth. And she had thrice been to Jerusalem, seen many strange rivers and passed over them. In this section, we find certain aspects of the wife of Bath with reference to the possessions, whatever she has, like her kerchiefs, her hose, her shoes. We come to the physical appearance of the lady in terms of her face, handsome, red in hue and also about her travels which you will see a little more in the next part. Most importantly we see her marital status. She had already had five husbands and she has also had many other men in her relationship. This is one aspect that feminist writers or critics may have some exception, but then at that time Chaucer was writing about this lady for a particular audience. And so, we have this ironical presentation of the wife of Bath, but at the same time Chaucer does not comment saying that she was a bad lady or a good lady. She had been to Rome and also to Boulogne, St. John's of Compostela and Cologne and she was skilled in wandering by the way. She had gap teeth set widely truth to say, easily on an ambling horse she sat, well wimpled up and on her head a hat, as broad as is a buckler or a shield. She had a flowing mantle that concealed large hips, her heels spurred sharply under that. In company she liked to laugh and chat and knew the remedies for love's mischances and art in which she knew the oldest dances. Again, again we have this ironical presentation, her mouth particularly with reference to her gap teeth is focused, her appearance with reference to the look, the face, I mean the large hips that she has and also her knowledge of the world, worldly life that she knows. We have a story that is a tale, an imaginary tale or a real tale that he saw and that was a common form of common art form in his uh, period. Chaucer the narrator now tells us about his own way of telling. He, now he takes the reader into confidence and tells. Now I have told you shortly in a clause the rank, the array, the number and the cause of our assembly in this company in Southwark at that high class hostelry known as the Tabard close beside the bell and now the time has come for me to tell how we behaved that evening. I will begin after we had alighted at the inn, then I will report our journey stage by stage all the remainder of our pilgrimage. Here we have many characters, but we have looked at only a sum and also na the narrator tells us 
he has presented all these characters according to their rank in some order and the number of characters and the cause that is the reason for which the company has arrived here in this uh, Tabard Inn. He continues the commentary on his own narration. But first I beg of you in courtesy not to condemn me as unmannerly if I speak plainly and with no concealings and give account of all their words and dealings using their very phrases as they fell for certainly as you all know so well. He who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say as nearly as he can each single word if he remembers it however rudely spoken or unfit or else the tale he tells will be untrue the things pretended and the phrases new. This is a story about a story about the way in which the story is told. The narrator begs of the reader to understand the way in which he has told the story. He tries to be honest, genuine and tells this is what he knows and he shares. Here we come to an important point about the storytelling uh, method of Chaucer. He continues, he may not flinch although it were his brother, he may as well say one word as another and Christ himself spoke broad in holy red, yet there is no scurrility in it. And Plato says for those with power to read the word should as cousin to the deed, further I beg you to forgive me. If I neglect the order and degree what is due to rank in what I have planned I am short of weight as you will understand. The poet quotes Christ to say that there is no scurrility or offence in telling the truth. He also refers to Plato who says the word and deed should be similar and if there is any problem he says tells the reader. I am short of weight as you will understand, but as you know very well Chaucer was a great poet, he had enough weight to entertain the royal court of his time and he continues to entertain people to this day. His writing at that time could be something like an equal to what we have in our TV serials today telling about people and their characteristics and their difficulties throughout their life. What are the aspects of poetry that we have in the prologue? First look at the form, it is a tale, it need not tell everything true about whatever we have in these characters. Some may be imaginary, some may be made up, some exaggeration will be there to make the story more interesting for the reader. To make the story interesting Chaucer uses certain poetic devices like metaphor, simile, irony, zugma. There is an element called hyperbaton which we find uh, being lost in translation. Here we have one example in the original here. The metrical aspect of this poem refers to the 10 syllables we have and the 5 feet we have and on the whole making iambic pentameter. We have alliteration in some examples like second strange strandes assonance in shore is sorter, we have rhyme end rhyme at the end, we have Cicero enough pause in the beginning, enough pause in the middle here and there and then we have enjambment that is lines move from one to another continuously. Let us read this four lines for understanding rhyme, Cicero and enjambment. One Sephiroth's egg with his sweet breath in spirit hath in every halt and hith, the tender crappes and the young sane hath in rama his half course irane. The line 5 continues with line 6 and we have a pause in the middle in line 7 after crappes we have indicated through a, a slash line and in rhyme we have breath hath sane rane. We have this continuous that is run on line from breath to inspirate, from sun to hat and these first 18 lines make up one long sentence. However, the 
poem is simple for us to understand. Certain ideological readings of this poem can be undertaken and this ideology can refer to many uh, persuasions, particularly the class structure that we have in this poem. We may not give answers to all these questions, but then these questions will lead you to understand the hierarchical society that we have in this poem. Why did Chaucer write the Canterbury Tales? He wrote some poems in French, some in Italian, fine, then why did he choose to write in English? How does the tale represent the medieval society? The question of representing a society of a particular time. It is said that Chaucer's poetry, particularly these Canterbury Tales, tells us more about medieval society than any historical book. What is the ideolo ideological function of the tale? In this particular question, we focus on the power structure hierarchy. Why does not Chaucer say anything negative about the knight? All other characters have some kind of defects in their characterization, whereas the knight alone does not have any problem in his character. He is the most idealized character we have. We also have one idealized character in the person or plowman, but particularly critics have asked questions about why the knight is so idealized. Why does Chaucer almost caricaturize a character called Reeve? One group of characters who have many defects in them, they are almost caricatures. Why does Chaucer idealize the person and the plowman? Did Chaucer criticize the aristocratic society of his times? We have to remember that Chaucer did not belong to aristocratic society. He was born in less than a middle class family. He rose steadily in his life. He always had contacts with aristocracy in his life. Why does he group the guildsmen, the tradesmen together and describe them in a few lines? He does not give more lines for the tradesmen. In fact, the cook of these guildsmen, he, the cook is described more vividly than the guildsmen. Why is it so? We have many questions. These questions relate to hierarchy and this hierarchy has some connections with the religious society of the time or the economic practices of the time or the social practices of the time. It will be very interesting for us to see what kind of attitude did Chaucer have towards upper class people or middle class people or lower class people. Or we refer to the peasants revolution at the beginning of Chaucer's uh, poetry. And what kind of role did Chaucer have during that time? In fact, Chaucer was a representative of the king, he was a member of parliament, he was an officer to deal with uh, problems of the peasants at one point of time. So, how did he really examine or look at things of his day? These are questions we can answer these questions based on our own convictions. A person with a Marxist tendency or with a completely economic background will look at this in one way. A person, a reader with a religious understanding will say some other things like this is a religious poem or it is a poem about pilgrimage and the host is connected with Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost and all that. It is a Christian poem, someone will argue like this. These are questions from different points of view and we will not be able to look at this poem from linguistic point of view because what we deal with is a translation, although from English to English. Now, let us have some fun with Chaucer's English. Even this English is slightly modified I believe. Let us have some fun as I said we will have fun with first, we will read the first 18 lines. 
One that April with his sure sorter, the drought of March hath pursed to the rotter, and bath every vein in such liquor, of which virtue engendered is a flower. One Zephyrus yak with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every halt and heath, the tender crappes, and the young son hath in the ram his half course irane. And smaller fowl is marking melodia, that slept and all the night with open ear. So pricketh him naturally in his courages, than lengthen folk to go on pilgrimages, and palmer is for to second strange standes to fern house, quoth in sand landes, and specially from every shirest end of England to Canterbury they went, the holy blissful martyr for to second that. Hem hath opened when that they were sicker. We hope you enjoyed listening to Chaucer's presentation of his characters. In this presentation, we have seen the arrival of the pilgrims in the prologue. We have examined Chaucer's portraits of certain characters like the knight, the nun, the friar, the Franklin the wife bath with reference to class, profession, activities, skills, social status, appearance, dress and age, beliefs and values, behavior and speech, patterns, possessions, equipment, even hearts. We mentioned about special identification markers with reference to the what in the miller. We focused on the narrator's comments about telling his own story, taking the reader into confidence, telling them I am trying to tell you the story as truthfully as possible. We examined some aspects of poetry in the prologue with reference to the metaphor at the beginning and similarly throughout the characters that we have discussed plus irony and hyperbole and also zugma in some contexts. You might have noticed that Chaucer uses more of similes than metaphor. He also uses more of irony. Occasionally, he uses hyperbole and zygma to indicate different characteristics of individuals. Finally, we focused on ideological readings of the Canterbury Tales with reference to the prologue. It all depends on the kind of critical persuasion or viewpoint that we have. Chaucer's poetry is a source of inspiration for a number of readers just for entertainment, just for enjoyment. It is also a source of critical interpretations to understand the medieval society. We have some references for you. If you refer to Blamereses article Chaucer the Reactionary ideology, ideology and the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, you will understand more about the ideological readings of this poem. Thank you. <laughs>